When you're designing a speculative creature, where do you like to start? I'll tend to gather maybe 10 or 20 references that are in the theme of the direction I'm going. Reference images of like fossil life, reconstructions, living things, even down to fungi and microscopic creatures. And then I, I bring that up in Photoshop and start sketching, referencing that. That's Alex Reese, a creature designer for Subnautica Below Zero, and one of the most talented speculative biology artists out there. Many of the creatures that swim in the seas of Planet 4546b started off as his idea, going through multiple iterations of concept art to arrive at the awe-inspiring final designs we see in-game. Yet there's a lot of incredible art of unique speculative life forms that, for one reason or another, never made it into the final product. Not implementing all designs from early development stages is a normal part of pre-production. But some of these designs are so well thought out, they deserve to be studied further. So, for this entry into the archive, we'll explore the incredible, unseen creatures of Subnautica, examining their potential biology and how they might fit into the existing environments of Planet 4546b. And if you like the art showcased in this video, you can support Alex Reese on Patreon using the links below. Now, let's return to the water of Subnautica and explore the speculative life forms that could have been. Beginning in the vast, open regions of Planet 4546b's ocean, some very unique leviathans almost swam. These enormous, curiously shaped creatures are called Thalassians and are imagined to fill the niche of a peaceful filter feeder, straining small food particles from the water using specialized mouths. Their fin structure gives them a distinctive profile, and Alex Reese says the creature uses its rear fins to swim in a manner similar to the oceanic sunfish of Earth. Reese created a lot of different color variations exploring the options for pigment and skin texture for these life forms, and I have to say, some of them are really striking. Like most of the life forms on this list, it's hard not to wish we could interact with them in game. Other potential organisms are more deadly. One life form that would work beneath sandy environments is the sand spear. This terrifying creature is an ambush predator that buries itself in sediment and waits for the unwary to swim overhead before striking. In behavior and appearance, the sand spear somewhat resembles Earth's bobbit worm, an alarming looking predator that also ambushes its prey. The sand spear's name and overall lifestyle also recalls the sand shark from the tropics, another species that buries itself beneath the sea floor only to emerge in spectacular fashion to snag its lunch. And like the sand shark, the sand spear attacks at high speeds, with the spiky maw extending out to snap up its prey. In addition to this veritable forest of teeth, the head of the sand spear features two tentacles that help them sense their targets while buried. These feelers are similar to the navigational appendages on the front of certain genera of marine slugs. All in all, while sand spears would have been an exciting inclusion, they'd make swimming near the sea floor much more stressful. Upon the ice floats, we almost got a very unusual type of symbiotic organism. The gardener eel is a bizarre creature that stores a small, tree-like plant in its gullet. While on the surface, it extrudes the plant into the waiting sun for photosynthesis. This type of symbiotic relationship between a plant and animal can appear in the natural world, and can be seen in the earth leaf sheep, a fascinating type of sea slug I've mentioned before in other entries. Leaf sheep can use the green algae on their backs to perform photosynthesis and produce simple sugars for food. The gardener eel doesn't spend all day in the sun, however, and can swallow the membrane and swim like a more traditional eel when in danger. A really inventive life form. Just under the ice of Sector Zero, a combative predator could have been prowling. This pugnacious creature is a bulldog trap jaw a mid-sized life form that doesn't look particularly threatening while in a neutral position. Swim too close, however, and the trap jaw lives up to its name by lashing out with a pair of long, raptorial jaws. These extendable mandibles have multiple functions, useful as both an offensive tool and a grasping mechanism to pull prey into their throat. The various species of moray eels in Earth's oceans have a convergent adaptation, 
Their secondary set of raptorial jaws are located further back in the eel's heads, and contain their own set of sharp teeth. Like the trap jaw, moray eels use their secondary jaws to restrain prey and drag them deeper into their gullet. Ultimately, the trap jaw, like the moray eel, is a creature you'd have to be wary of on a dive. Deeper into the depths, another dangerous life form could have been waiting in the eerie light of the crystal caves. The Shard Runner is a patient hunter, spinning out long, fragile, mineralized tripwires to detect prey. When an unlucky soul touches a wire, the Shard Runner knows their location and strikes with lethal accuracy. This kind of behavior is almost convergent with that of certain spiders on land, which likewise can sense any prey that becomes entangled in the filaments of their web. Some spiders can sense their prey using macroreceptory organs called silts and cilia. So, it's likely the Shard Runner has developed an analogous sensory organ to detect life forms entangled in its own mineralized web. Notably, some of these hypothetical life forms are relatives of pre existing creatures that evolved to fill different niches, and as a result, possess highly divergent biology. One of the most awe inspiring creatures from planet 4546b is the reefback leviathan of the tropics. And these gentle giants almost had a polar relative in the form of the icebreaker leviathan, a concept which is one of Alex Reese's favorites. So, if you could add one cut creature you created into Subnautica Below Zero, what would it be? Um, I would have gone probably with the Icebreaker Leviathan, remembering the reefbacks and the impact I, they had on me. I thought bringing that creature, that design, into the Arctic environment could be interesting, and one possible take would be that they have to forge their way through the ice. I knew that would have a lot of implications when you have a creature interacting with the environment like that. It could be a sort of a nesting place for the penguins to live on. It could be sort of a moving ice flow almost. Uh, in the end, it wasn't included. I think it just would have been very, very difficult to implement in terms of programming, but I think that would have been my choice. Aside from the reef back, out of all the creatures in the original Subnautica, one of the most iconic, and most imposing, was the dreaded Reaper Leviathan. For Below Zero, Alex Reese imagined that a smaller, yet more agile relative known as the Crested Reaper might have terrorized the frigid waters. Roughly the size of an orca, the Crested Reaper are a very different kind of predator than the Reapers we're familiar with. In another parallel to Earth orcas, the Crested Reaper is exceptionally cunning, able to bump ice flows to knock out of reach prey into the water, a behavior that real orcas have been observed doing. The Crested Reaper takes this hunting strategy a step further, however, with its characteristic crest actually a specialized ice ram that aids in jostling ice floats. The concept of a smarter, more maneuverable offshoot of a Reaper Leviathan is really intriguing albeit slightly scary. Other imagined offshoots are far less menacing. As an example, we have the Grab Squid, a smaller, more intelligent polar relative of the huge and terrifying Crab Squid. Much like how the Crab Squid possesses a mysterious bioelectric discharge, the tiny Grab Squid can generate a weak bioelectric field. As a result, the Grab Squid is naturally drawn to small electrical devices like batteries a behavior that mirrors how its deep water relative is drawn to larger energy sources. Large animals evolving a reduced body size in response to a limited environment is a well-documented form of adaptation. My favorite Earth example of this are the Channel Island Mammoths, an isolated population of mammoths that were almost 10 feet or 3 meters shorter than their mainland relatives. So, the limited resources of the frigid Sector Zero shaping the massive crab squid into the tiny grab squid holds up from an evolutionary perspective. Curiously, an alternate name for the grab squid offshoot is the sea monkey, as this concept was actually an early take on the quite different looking sea monkeys that made it into the final game. So in your opinion, which creature changed the most during development? I think actually the sea monkey might have gone through the most iterations because that thing started off a complete blank slate. It took quite a while to arrive on a more friendly sort of look because the focus was more on alienness, but we tried to make it more sort of mischievous and readable. It went in so many strange directions that one of the creatures spun off 
into the trivalve. So the trivalve was one of the early sea monkey attempts, but it was oh. so it was different enough that we managed to spin it off into its whole other creature. In the vast skies above the teeming oceans, we almost had a unique predator in the form of the kite wing, a relative of the much smaller sky rays. The gentle sky rays can be seen flying over various regions of planet 4546b, and are the only life form in either game to evolve powered flight. The kite wing would add some exciting variety to the skies of Subnautica, by being not just a passive life form, but a serious threat. Alex Reese imagined a few different variants of this tyrant of the skies, including one with extra talons and an imposing crest. This head crest resembles the crown structures of certain pterosaurs, which paleontologists believe may have emerged for social displays and improved aerodynamics. So, it's likely the mighty crest of the kite wing serves a similar purpose. It's easy to imagine these swooping terrors flying through the skies of planet 4546b. Returning to entirely unique lifeforms, in the twilight of the abyss, a predator unlike any other could have made an appearance. The ascender worm might appear like your average squid-like organism at a glance. Yet what sets this lifeform apart is its highly unusual hunting method. The small ascender worm might not have the jaws or muscle to take down large prey, but it has another weapon, decompression sickness. When the ascender worm hunts, it grabs onto its unsuspecting prey with two deceptively strong tentacles, and rapidly inflates with gas, dragging its target to the surface in the hopes the pressure change will kill them. Decompression sickness, also called the bends, is a real danger that divers face, and is caused by gaseous bubbles forming inside the body due to depressurization. A grim fate indeed. Other theoretical lifeforms could have even stranger methods of attack and defense. The shard is a creature that travels slowly through the water vertically like a knife, luring prey from below with its glowing lure. While this lure calls to mind the classic anglerfish, the shard's vertical swimming posture actually reminds me of another deep sea creature, the elusive oarfish, which has been recorded swimming in a similar manner. But what really makes the shard stand out is its defensive capabilities. When attacked, it quickly produces hypersaline slime, which rapidly forms into an ice shell around its body, from which it suddenly swims free. This leaves the predator to attack the shard's false ice shadow, while the real life form escapes. A surreal, yet ingenious, form of defense. One of the more distinctive regions of Subnautica Below Zero is the Thermal Spires, an ecosystem defined by chimney-shaped hydrothermal vents. One species which could have been part of this environment is the Vent Spider, an arthropod-like animal which would crawl between the vents on long, spindly legs. On Earth, all kinds of sea spiders have emerged, with some large bottom dwellers that creep along the sea floor and others light enough to swim, although not particularly gracefully. Yet the vent spider is unique due to its method of getting food. It possesses feathery gills which gather sulfur from around the vents to feed extremophile bacteria in its abdomen. Strange as this might sound, hydrothermal vents on Earth are home to all manner of specialized life forms that can feed off the rich chemical soup the vents produce. Among these life forms are bacteria, which have evolved to be highly resistant to the heat of the boiling vents. So, the idea of a symbiotic alliance between such bacteria and a larger life form like a vent spider isn't so far fetched after all. In the original games, there's all sorts of dangerous creatures to look out for, but one particularly unnerving concept would make these life forms even more deadly. The rot nest is a parasite which would infect other creatures on planet 4546b. This parasite would take over the brains of their hosts, and transform them into a launching platform for jet-propelled spore pods, which would explode and infect nearby lifeforms, spreading the infection. Terrifying as this concept sounds, we can find something similar on Earth. One infamous strain of fungus can take over the bodies of ants, hijacking their minds and essentially turning them into zombies, using their motor functions to move to an ideal spot to sprout and spread their spores to other lifeforms. 
and the rot nest works in the same way, with their host eventually passing away and the rot nest slowly digesting what remains, and launching spore pods at any creatures foolish enough to investigate. A truly menacing concept. Yet out of all the creatures in Subnautica below zero, the Shadow Leviathan is perhaps the most intimidating and well-known. At multiple points throughout its development, however, it looked quite different. I'm curious, what was your process like for designing the Shadow Leviathan? It came to a fork in the road with that creature. We needed something big and scary. Uh, I did a bunch of initial sketches, which had a more traditional, almost like a dragon-like head. It had glowing white teeth and huge jaws, like a deep sea viper fish and stuff like that, but sort of vertebrate looking almost. But I also had a bunch of references of uh, things called arrow worms, horrifying little invertebrates that just have a face that's basically a bunch of nested spines coming out of it. I just did one little study where instead of the dragon-like face, it was this more invertebrate face. Among all those, that sort of connected with people a little bit more. It was sort of disturbing. And uh, combining that with a bit of lamprey and a few other marine creatures that people generally find horrifying, uh, we moved in that direction. It definitely scared me during my playthrough. And there's one Leviathan which didn't make it into the final game, which might have been even larger than the Shadow Leviathan. The Ice Dragon is a cut creature with a size and design so intimidating that it lives up to its mythical namesake. We can see from the concept art that the Ice Dragon would swim on wing-like flippers, another visual nod to the Dragons of Earth myth. This alien dragon wouldn't breathe fire, however, but release a stream of brinical ice breath to trap vehicles. Sort of like a scaled up version of the brine fish in the final game, which Alex Reese also designed. In fact, the ice dragon is so large, its size could have been an issue in terms of actually implementing the life form into the final game. While this is understandable, I do wish you could encounter this frozen terror under the ice of Below Zero. And there's one final cut life form we need to cover. All throughout the original game and its sequel, mysterious structures built by a group of aliens called Precursors, or Architects, remain abandoned. The Architects only appear in game as AI, or artificial reconstructions, so we don't have any idea what they actually look like. Or do we? This early concept art by Alex Rees shows some potential designs for what the biological forms of Architects could have looked like. The architects are so mysterious in game, I'm curious how you decided to approach their design. I wanted them to be sort of fastidious creatures, a bit precise, nerdy almost. So I tried to design a creature along those lines, something that could use the tools and the environment that we'd already seen, something that could use a tablet type computer, but still alien. So I started moving in a sort of a direction that combined amphibious references, reptilian, but I think a combination of salamanders and mantis shrimps were my main inspiration. That's so cool. We've now seen an incredible variety of life forms that almost swam in the oceans of Planet 4546b and learned a lot about creature design along the way. A tremendous thank you to Alex Reese for being in this episode and sharing insights into his design process. If you enjoyed discovering the unseen creatures of Subnautica and want to see more, you can support Alex Reese on Patreon using the links in the description. And as always, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this entry, you can lend your support by liking, subscribing, and hitting the notification icon to stay up to date on all things curious. See you in the next video.